Hi there. Welcome to this expert interview. In week six of the course, we discussed the importance of bridging the gap between academia and the world of practitioners. Fortunately, there are quite a number of positive examples of individuals, networks, initiatives that try to do this. And we're delighted to have an expert with us today who is a very positive example of making this link between theory and practice work. Dr. Richard Warns, who is a senior consultant at Vedette Consulting, a defense and security consultancy firm, was also a research fellow at RAND Europe and a steering committee member of EENET, the European Expert Network on Terrorism Issues. Before his work at RAND and at Vedette, he served in the Metropolitan Police for nine years, including as part of Special Branch and Counterterrorism Command. And he was also a member of the Army Intelligence Corps uh, and has been stationed in Bosnia. Welcome, Dr. Uh, Dr. Warns. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, Edwin. Really appreciate it. Well, I just mentioned you are part of the EENET, uh, the European Expert Network on Terrorism Issues. Could you tell us what is network and its um, mission and tilt? Yes. Yeah, so um, around about 2008, um, the Dutch NCTV and uh, the German BKA, the sort of federal security um, policing body, um, gathered together a group of European experts in a kind of informal gathering. Um, and it's developed and grown since then. And the whole point of the European Experts Network is to provide a platform and to facilitate exactly the point that you've raised there, an integration between academics, um, policing practitioners, and, and in some cases, although obviously discreetly, various uh, intelligence professionals. And, and the idea is to regularly provide a, an opportunity to discuss, to engage and to learn amongst those groups with workshops, forums and so forth. It's actually quite a, a unique uh, setting with, with the variety of the, the members that you mentioned that somehow there's enough trust to, to share ideas uh, between these organizations. And I get it, 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 uh, it meets or it has conferences. So how does it work in practice? How do these people meet? Yes, so, so the, main ev the main event is the, the annual conference. And obviously, sadly, like, like so many other agencies and institutions with COVID, um, you know, there was a cancellation and we've had to operate last year with a kind of uh, a, virtual, a virtual conference. Um, but again, this year, we're looking forward in October to having a proper annual conference. So the highlight of each year is normally a major annual conference over a couple of days where all of the practitioners uh, and academics and others can actually meet face to face and actually present papers, discussions, debates. Um, and, uh, you know, there have been some very good examples where, um, for example, some academics have uh, posited some of their research and then asked forums to discuss it further and, and actually gain some really useful insights from other practitioners and academics to uh, to inform their research. So it's it's really good opportunity, as you say, to, to have a level of trust where they can engage with each other and learn from each other, both practitioner and academic. I was happy to, to join actually quite a number of these meetings. Uh, you're a very prominent member of that network. And that's also, I guess, partly, as I mentioned, uh, your CV, that you have worked in this actually in both worlds. So, so how have you tried personally to bridge the gap between academia and practice? Yeah, thanks, Edwin. I, I think it, for me, as you say, it's a very strong personal um, factor because of having straddled both worlds or straddling both worlds. Um, and I think probably for me, the main thing was the, 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 the main line of my own academic research, um, which is to try and, and bridge that gap by interviewing practitioners in counterterrorism, gaining access to them and to try and gain their insights. And so my, my own doctoral research, which I've kind of built upon and written papers based upon, was interviewing policing, intelligence and military counterterrorist practitioners to uh, establish their insights uh, um, and perceptions on types of threats and more appropriately on types of, of useful response. The, the biggest issue as you came back to, and you mentioned before is trust, is, is the difficulty of uh, bringing together both the, the academic and the practitioner worlds 
and, and bridging that, that issue of trust, which um, I suppose in my case, I was lucky because the background gave me more of an, uh, an opportunity to gain that access. Um, I've noticed one of the problems that I found, I suppose it's almost like a mission for me to, to try and bring these two worlds together because I'm sort of in, in the midst of both to some extent. Um, and I have found uh, sometimes a level of frustration, uh, if, I, if I'm honest, uh, on both sides. Um, and I'll give you some examples of that, um, but without going to too much detail, maybe. So, for example, um, I was privileged enough to interview some counter-terrorist policing specialists in one country. Um, and they invited me to go to their headquarters, which is kind of a discreetly located premise. And uh, the first thing they said to me, and I'm there in my role as an academic to interview them, was, um, we're glad to see you, but you wouldn't be here now if we didn't know that you've got a background in policing and security. You were not part of the police uh, at that time? You had, uh, or you're partly also working uh, for, for government? Uh... No, at that, at, that stage, at that stage, I was at the tail end of my police yeah. service. But but that was automatically the the the, the kind of yeah, sentence. But you're still one of them. Uh, you're one of them, yeah, and, and yeah. actually th that that helps a lot with some of the mm -hmm. interviews. So um, you know when I've interviewed police officers as a former policeman, I'm one of them. If I interview military personnel because I served in the military previously, you know you're you you understand the language and mm -hmm. the culture, and you're kind of seen. It's a bit chameleon like. Um, but it can be frustrating because you see this kind of um, this problem between the two different groups. So, for example, um, some of the military personnel have turned around and, and said, you know, um, why would we talk to academics? What could what what is it that the academics could give us? We're doing it for real. We know the real world. And most of what they produce is ivory tower. Um, and in fact, you know, as you know, many times I've said to practitioners, there's a lot of useful stuff that you could maybe learn that's being written by academics that you could incorporate in, in practical terms, in your planning, in your operations, in your understanding. And then the flip side is reverse where I've talked to academics um, who maybe because they don't have the access, but they, they look down, sometimes they look down on practitioners. You know, if they were bright, they would have done something else or they would have got a master's degree or, or a doctoral qualification. And so you see it on both sides, this, this kind of, um, not Stereotypes or, contempt, no. but this kind of, this, this lack of trust and, and lack of willingness to actually interface. So yeah. I find that quite frustrating. And then what, what is it that the academic world has to offer? Like what, because these people that on a daily basis do all kinds of CT work or other relevant uh, um, um, activities in, sure. in light of, let's say, the, the struggle against uh, terrorism. So what is it that the academics can, can bring? What, what, uh, what is really different? What can they add to, um, to a practitioner? I, I think what, what we can do is, is from the academic point of view is, if we could get what I call sort of field-based academic research, real sort of hands-on level research um, that's tailored for perhaps more of a practitioner academic rather than other academics, um, but also particularly comparative analysis where, for example, we're, we're drawing out the best practice and best examples. If we can shape academic research to have real kind of value in that sense and, and, and practical utility, um, then I think we're more likely to get a kind of engagement and uh, a trust with the practitioners if, if they can see the benefits of, of what they're being presented with. And, and I think perhaps the other thing is, is shaping it perhaps in terms of the use of language to maybe um, avoid um, too much academic academic mm -hmm. sort of speech and, and almost tailoring it in terms of like the use of language or writing to better reflect the practitioners. Yeah. Well, I think the days that the academic world, so the only output was, let's say, a peer-reviewed article in a journal that was not accessible to the rest of the world are behind us, fortunately. Uh, but yeah. I still think there's a, a, a lot of room for improvement in uh, different forms, different language, as you, as you mentioned. Yeah. Um, what you mentioned trust a lot uh of course there are a lot of 
other limitations so what did you come uh come across and how did you manage to overcome yeah so the uh, biggest issue hurdles? i think one of the other major issues that you're facing there is uh is the is the problem to do with um sensitivity of information um and also trusting that the academic is actually going to utilize and understand what they've been given in a, an appropriate way so um one of the issues there is again this comes to building up personal trust with the practitioners um, because we've had situations before where, you know, the, 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 the practitioner doesn't want to engage because they don't know what will happen to the information they pass on. They don't trust where it's going or the risk of misinterpretation where, you know, the, the practitioner doesn't want to give him information in case the practitioner, I'm sorry, the academic misuses it or doesn't understand it appropriately. So there's a lot to be said for almost embedding um, as an academic, really engaging with the practitioners to build up that personal level of trust before you conduct the research. And I think you're right there. Um, much of the academic research that's being written is almost for a peer reviewed audience or for, you know, a, a paper which is aimed at, uh, I suppose, at, at a similar level of academics, you know, because obviously it's a, a peer reviewed publication process for the academic academic world. And, and perhaps there's almost a need to kind of a, adjust, as you say, that writing and that and that methodology to make it more practical. It may not hit the appropriate levels for peer review, but it may be that that's really useful from a practitioner's perspective. Well, well, great to hear, uh, and 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 thanks for sharing your experience. I, I think you uh, you have uh, both academics and the world of practitioners a lot to offer, um, and you do so partly uh, as part of the EE Net um, uh, network. Um, so thanks for sharing your experience. Uh, for those who would like to know more about your publications, your academic world, uh, we will list a number of key publications. And if you're interested in the EENET, I'd say um, visit the website. Um, and for now, Dr. Warns, thank you very much for sharing your insights with us. Thank you very much. Thanks, Edwin. Really appreciate it. Cheers.